Hi, welcome to the Libro FM podcast, the monthly series where we talk to authors, narrators, booksellers, and more. I'm Karen. And I'm Craig. On today's episode, we sit down with the author Kelsey Norris, who released their debut collection of short stories on October 17th, titled House Gone Quiet. Oh, yes, we both got to read this. We enjoyed it. I've also listened to the audiobook. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with this book, it is described as, and I quote, an eerie, irresistible debut story collection about the bonds and bounds of community and what it means to call a place home. All things that I love. Short stories, eerie things. Kelsey. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Also love Kelsey. Um, For listeners, Kelsey used to work at Libro. So uh, Karen and I know Kelsey very well. Um, I remember when we were in Seattle for some work trip and um, we were all hanging out together. Kelsey was like, guys, I think I might like have a publishing deal. It was like, (laughs) it just felt like so long ago. Um, So I'm so excited to see all of this come to fruition. Um, And I also loved the book and cannot be happier for Kelsey if it was possible. Absolutely agreed. So let's start the episode. Um, Just a reminder to our listeners, if you don't follow the podcast yet, we would love if you did. Um, Also, if you have a second, please rate and review or subscribe. Um, If you haven't signed up for Libro FM membership and you want to give it a shot, you can listen to Kelsey's new book, House Gone Quiet, and many others. Use the code Libro Podcast when you sign up and you'll get two audiobooks for your first month of membership instead of just one. All right, everyone, enjoy the interview. And as always, stay tuned afterwards to hear what Karen and I are currently listening to. And maybe we'll tease some upcoming episodes that we're excited about. So thanks for listening. Kelsey, welcome to the podcast. For our listeners who may not be familiar with your work yet, could you please give us a brief introduction? Yeah, so I'm Kelsey Norris. I have a book coming out with Scribner and Simon & Schuster uh, called House Gone Quiet on October 17th. It is my debut story collection. Huge congratulations on House Gone Quiet. Um, Craig and I are very grateful we got to read an advanced reader's copy of it and could not put it down, could not stop like gushing about how much we loved it. And I can't wait for everyone to read this book. Um, It's so exciting to share it with y'all, to be like, (laughs) people, and especially y'all. So. (laughs) I know when my neck my neck alley got approved, I was like, oh my God. Know, it's happening. <laughs> um, this is probably an obvious question, but would you be willing to share kind of a brief overview of House Gone Quiet for our listeners and what they what they can look forward to? Yeah, totally. So House Gone Quiet is a collection of 10 stories. Um, there are linked stories that follow like a certain cast of characters or that are about like a particular place. Um, but this particular collection uh is more unified by theme. Um, It's 10 stories of characters sort of searching for home and searching for a sense of community and belonging. Um, But as far as subject matter, they're sort of all over the map. There's a story about um, a group of women who are sent across a border into enemy territory to make husbands of the enemy, and they're trying to decide if they're going to kill their husbands. Uh, There's a town where the mayor tells everyone um, they can't wear clothes anymore. So it's about uh, the repercussions of that. Um, There's also a story in there about a group of joggers who meet at a Dick's Sporting Goods to discuss (laughs) um, the bodies that they have found on their runs. So we are sort of all over the map (laughs) as far as subject matter, but it's all about um, sort of community and belonging and what it means to belong or not to. I'm so curious about this as a person who loves reading short stories, but does not write them. Um, I am wondering how you decide what stories to include in the collection. Cause I I'm like, were there ones that didn't make the cut that you almost put in, but didn't, um, as you've worked on this, like, how have you made those calls about the the structure of it? Yeah, there were. So, um, I started this collection during my MFA program at Vanderbilt. Um, and the collection that I put together for my thesis there was more, I think it, it was, it was less together. It was less unified than this uh, final collection ended up being. So there are some stories there that sort of had to fall to the side. I think at that point I was trying to figure out, you know, that there are wonderful collections of like Southern writers writing Southern stories. And there are also, you know, sort of like more identity-based collections where, for instance, like a Black writer is writing about the experience of Blackness and all those different shades and colors that that can come in. And so I think while both of those things are in this collection, it has Southern stories, it has Black characters. Um, I think it took me a minute to figure out 
that I also sort of wanted to play with form and and play with other story elements that weren't so character based or weren't so place based. Um, so so yeah, I think um, as I, I I went to a workshop, I went to um, Tin House Summer Workshop after I had written a large bulk of these stories and worked with some wonderful writers there and some wonderful mentors there. And I think I was able to sort of like hone the pitch of what brought these stories together. And then once I had figured that out, um, I wrote a couple more stories to like fill the gaps that were there uh, with that. But, um, and then, and then just started pitching those to, to agents and pitching those to publishers. And that's how it came about. So cool. And it also makes me want like the, equivalent of the outtakes reel i'm like can i read the other <laughs> stories too, <laughs> yeah, too? I, I want the b-sides <laughs> <Stay tuned. Yeah. laughs> um kind of my last question on this because i could ask you a million um i happen to know from early conversations that you and i had that we're both big fans of the book friday black and i mm-hmm. saw on the cover of your book that like this your book is being <laughs> recommended to people who love Friday Black. And there's also a very spectacular blurb um, by (laughs) someone that I know that you really admire as a writer. Um, What has that felt like to have people that you just admire so much blurb the book and see it show up on like really exciting um, new up and coming lists that are that are being released now? Um, It's wild. Uh, It's very (laughs) exciting. Yeah. Nana, uh, who is on the cover of my book uh, with a a very kind blurb and who has been like such a wonderful mentor to me, uh, even before we had like talked one on one, just his stories sort of did that. Um, And I think writers like Nana, well, Nana himself and writers like him, um, who sort of played with subject and played with like discomfort and played with weirdness in their stories to sort of like make something else shine through right um like Karen Russell's another Carmen Marie Machado's another um where there's sort of like an unbalanced element in their in their stories that lets them talk about like social uh social topics in like a new and interesting way um and you know that's not all their stories are doing but uh those were very like permission giving while I was um, still learning sort of what the bounds of what I was comfortable with doing and what I needed to push myself towards doing while I was writing. So, um, but I got to work under Nana at that workshop. Um, and, and we worked through one story together and then it was, it was Nana really who was like, I think if you have other stories that are up to this level of doneness, then it might be time to think about the fact that you have a book and that you need to start talking about this as a book and start looking for people to also be able to, you know, like looking for a place for it to land. Um, and he also talked me through so much of the publishing process, which is strange and bewildering. And it is really helpful to have somebody to sort of guide you through it. Um, and I also, I, I mean, I love his writing also. So it's, it's, it's all just like very exciting to, to have a writer. I so admire as someone that I can ask questions. As Karen said, we could not be happier for you. Um, for listeners, we used to work with Kelsey. So we've hung out and it was just so exciting. I remember in the early days, you were like talking about getting this together and that the, the publishing date was like, it felt very far off, but here we are. Yeah. Um, it's coming out in a couple months. So congratulations. Great. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, for for folks who don't know, um, you used to be a bookseller. Uh, so you worked at a bookshop and then you were also a school librarian, which I didn't know until I did some research for this podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, like I said, you worked with us briefly, which I'm sure was the highlight of your life. Um, but now as a, from there is a, is a downslide, yeah, but I'm trying yeah, to, yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 But now as a full-time writer for aspiring writers, can you tell us what that journey looked like? I mean, going from working in a bookstore to being where you are now, like what was that like? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, <laughs> I feel like it sounds, you know, like anybody's career sounds like together in retrospect, but yeah. at the time, it was like, wow, you know, felt a little <laughs> more frenzied. Um, But before I went to grad school, uh, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Namibia. um, And actually one of the stories in the collection is set on a salt pan, you know, uh, right behind where I used to live. Um, So, you know, the the content of that story is more imagined, but it was cool to be able to base it off of a place. But while I was there in Namibia, I worked as a teacher and then I also ran our school library. So that was uh, wonderful. It was, there was a a, a couple volunteers before me who had put in a big effort. Um, but in two-year assignments and turnovers and stuff and just 
different um different focuses for those for those people the the library needed a little revamp so it was really wonderful to be able to do that and to also be able to uh like instill in my in my students a real love of reading then i went to grad school um and then after that i uh worked in a bookstore i worked in one locally here in dc uh called bus boys and poets um which is sort of a bookstore and also a restaurant and um, a community space. So uh, worked there for a while. And then as the pandemic approached, there were some complications that came up and I had to leave. <laughs> uh, and then luckily, uh, Libro FM was hiring uh, booksellers who had been affected by the pandemic. So that is how uh, I got in with Libro. And it was a temporary position there where I, I believe there were 10 of us in total hired to work across the company in different different aspects. Um, and then I just stayed on afterwards. Uh, and then, yeah. And here I am, uh, at this point I'm working full time as a writer, which is wild. And I feel very lucky to be able to do it and for however long I can. And I feel like throughout that career, I've been very lucky to, to work places where my colleagues are excited about books, like where my, my job is talking about books, my job is promoting books, whatever it is. So uh, I think I think maybe I just followed books around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what led to those brands. I will say that working at a bookstore was a danger. It's like very dangerous to work to get your paycheck from the place where you most want to spend your. <laughs> um. So I had to navigate that while I was there. But my office is above a bookstore, and I don't get any kind of discount or anything, and it's still dangerous. I can't imagine <laughs> like being in it every day. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would just take my page, I can hand it directly back to them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned instilling a love of reading in your, in your students. Do you feel like the experiences as a bookseller and a, and a librarian have shaped the writer that you've become? Um, I think that they have made me maybe less, I, cause during my MFA program, you're sort of reading like a very particular, you're reading a lot of literary fiction. You're reading some experimental literary fiction. Um, but I think like I I was surrounded by people who, who loved that kind of writing and I do that kind of writing. Um, but that, that's sort of the writing that we were talking about. And I think comparatively, like working as a librarian and working as a bookseller, uh, sort of taught me about like the whole vast world of, of books. And I think to some extent, audiobooks as well, like that was not something that was necessarily on my radar as a reader and as a writer. And I feel like all those experiences sort of like uh, maybe help me branch into different genres that I wouldn't have. Also, I feel like my, my like feeling on genre is, is like, it's, it's helpful in some ways for categoriz- categorization, but also sometimes is a little arbitrary. Like I like things that lean in more than one direction. Um, but I, but I think like, uh, encountering readers who are so passionate about their particular genre or their wide array of genres, I think gave me more respect for different kinds of writing and the different like sorts of talents that are, that are sitting in that writing. So kind of piggybacking off of the, the career journey question and the following of the books, Mm -hmm. um, you've, you've shifted from kind of like having to share time across your passions (laughs) with, you know, the work that you're doing, um, to being a full-time writer, which is so cool. And I am just so curious to know, like, what is your, what is your day-to-day or your week by week look like? Cause I know it's more than just the actual writing there's the editing and there's the publicity and the marketing and the taking of mm-hmm. shots for book covers and stuff like can you just give us a little glimpse into what life is like with this is your your full-time job <laughs> I mean that's stuff that you mentioned like the the stuff at the end like taking headshots and doing doing interviews like this one and and doing publicity stuff that's sort of like the more like glamorous side but I feel like <laughs> those, are, those are sort of few and far between especially because well, A, it's a lot of like hurry up and wait because you're waiting until you get to pub day to do a lot of that. But also the the publishing industry, like like good news happens about a year and a half before you're able to like really hand somebody a finished product of, of okay. that thing. Um, so I feel, I feel like the time in between that is sort of, I feel like being a writer is like, uh, it's like giving myself homework. Like I have assigned, <laughs> I've assigned my work. It is like important to me that I finish it. Otherwise, like not particularly. So it's it's very self-driven uh, compared to 
like other jobs that I've had where there's a box of books to unload or there's a class coming in or there's a meeting to attend, right? So it's a little trickier to sort of schedule my my day because because I'm so used to having those brief moments of being able to squeeze in creativity in between. And I think when I first started, I sort of struggled with the with feeling maybe unproductive because whereas I can squeeze in or where you know it's it's the norm to have like an eight hour workday and focus for at least the majority of that of that workday. Uh eight hours of of writing for me looks like many other things other than writing. <laughs> There's just like a long lead up time to I mean like summertime luckily I can like go on a walk and like go outside and and fix something in the garden and that counts as like time getting into the book and I do a lot of reading um whether it's craft books or um nonfiction or fiction too but um sometimes I'm a little picky about what I'm reading when so that I don't maybe like start to mimic in a way that's mm. not helpful so sometimes I'll read away from my subject material or I'll read like craft books, which are about the subject, but not so much like lines so that I don't, cause I, I think for me, um, rhythm and like sentence rhythm is really important. So I want to make sure that I'm, you know, all the readers that I've, or all the writers that I've read, I feel like their rhythms are like in the back of my brain, but I sort of want to keep those in the back so that I don't bring them to the front and just pull directly from that. So, so there's a lot of thinking about writing that goes into writing. Uh, and then there, there's probably about like three or four hours of, of productive, like scooting through and like actually getting words down on the page. And I have, I have this, uh, productivity app that really helps where it gives me like every 30 minutes, it says like, good job, Kelsey. And then it gives me like a five to 10 <laughs> break. And then I sort of like get on my phone and do whatever, go and grab some water, go and pet the dog or whatever. But, um, but yeah, it, I mean, it is thrilling and also an adjustment. Um, and it, but it is sort of nice in that it feels like my life can also come into writing, you know, like I don't, in, in thinking about, okay, I can't write for nine hours a day. That means like that the other, the other components of my life get to feed into that, that writing as well. I don't know if that makes sense. Totally. Totally. What's been the biggest surprise about, about this, this life? (laughs) Surprise. I mean. Mm, naps okay so I love <laughs> I don't want to make it sound like I'm sleeping all the time I, I love a nap not, too <laughs> but I love a nap I look I've always loved it and before um uh you know I would take like 20 minute like 15 minute naps in the middle of the day or something just to be you know post post eating or whatever but now uh my naps are a lot more active like uh, I get to <laughs> an do an active something. nap I mean, I feel, I do feel, it's like a half sleep kind of thing where Mm. like my eyes are closed and maybe I'm not knocked all the way out, but you know, that moment where you're like about to fall asleep and you're aware that like your dreams are like your brain is doing some weird story moves. You're like, Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm about to fall into a dream. I feel like a thing I've been able to do lately is like sort of control where that like go into it thinking like, okay, we've got this like story problem to figure out. Let's like think through. And then a lot of times whether or not I fall asleep all the way or whatever, but I'll, I'll wake up on the other side with like kind of a line to go, to go with and, um, to start for it. And the, um, the other maybe like surprising element is that this new project that I'm working on is a novel compared to, um, a short story collection. And it's in, it's very like early drafts, but the project of writing a novel is, it, it is wildly different. I think like, I'm a huge advocate for short story collections. I think there's this like there's this idea that they're like warm ups to a novel or that they're less um palatable or that they're they show like less talent or something when actually I think they're they're just like two distinct sort of writing forms. I, I think of it of like TV versus movies. And like I I think for me, I'm like stories, like short stories are really wonderful for especially that feeling of like when you're in between a bunch of books or like you haven't felt, you don't feel like you don't have the energy to maybe like complete an entire book or like Mm -hmm. have the time to invest or whatever, or you just, you just want to feel like you completed something. Like, I feel like a story collection has these like goalposts built in where they're like, good job, okay, pick up the next one when you're ready. You know, like you, you get to hold, like for the most part, you can read a short story in one sitting. So you get to hold like the entirety of the story in your head. Um, so versus like a novel, right? Where writing that you're 
I, it's just like a long period of time. I, I just went to a talk that Lori Moore gave at Politics and Prose, and uh, she writes novels and short stories and is celebrated for both. And she sort of talked about how um, shorts, she doesn't think that one is better necessarily as like a form of writing, but she does think that like short story writers suffer a little bit less because there's, <laughs> there, as I have heard um, more than one writer sort of talk about like that writing a novel is like swimming in the ocean and you can't see where you started or where you're going. And you're sort of just like, and like sometimes it's nighttime and you're still just like paddling through the water and just like you sort of have to have this like internal faith that you know where you're going versus when I write a short story, most of the time I have a sense of either the ending or the last line, or I've written the last scene already. So I sort of know where I'm going. So the, the, you know, they're different. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a really good metaphor. I love that. I have follow-up questions on some mm-hmm. things you just mentioned, but I'll, <laughs> I'll pause for <laughs> Um, you can get, I mean, I, I, I'm looking at the script too, if you want to just jump into that, because it's, it's kind of where the conversation is went. I think that's totally fine, Karen. I'm, I'm not looking at the script. No, you're not. <laughs> you did ask for it though. Yeah. Everything is a surprise. <laughs> okay. Um, I just have been dying to know about this, this book number two. Um, cause I, I was like, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure this was a two book deal. And I, I was like, I don't know if she'll be able to talk about it yet or how much we're able to know about it. But I was just curious if there's anything you can share about the novel. I feel like, so I I sort of have this policy with, because like with with the short story collection, I'm often like writing off of such weird premises that it like doesn't really make sense to talk about before you're through it. You know, like, Mm -hmm. yeah, these joggers are meeting and they're talking about bodies that they found on their runs. You know, like it's sort of, it like, it, it it sort of falls flat without like the semblance of the entire thing behind it for, and I, and I, I think it can feel like that sometimes too. And I'm like talking about a project before it's done where I'm like, either I'll talk myself out of it. If, if I'm talking about the premise, I'll be like, well, actually it's kind of dumb. And then it'll be harder <laughs> to turn back to it or just like, you don't end up doing it any, any justice. So I think for now, I'm just like sitting on it and trying to, to give myself the time to sort of figure out what it is. Cause I do think it's, Normally when I write a short story, I am closer to the final version of whatever it's going to, there's normally like, you know, working around and editing and being like, actually, this chunk doesn't make sense. Let me go back. And it's really wonderful to get like readers eyes on that and to be like, actually, I'm not following you during this part. Can you go back and rewrite? But I think for a novel from, from what I've heard from people who have worked through it for the first time or after many times, the, the sort of prevailing knowledge is that you have to finish it all the way to know what you have. And then the editing process is is going to be like a lot more intense or intensive because I think then I'll have to assemble all those pieces into a story that makes <laughs> sense and like cut that. I don't know why that character showed up or like, I don't know why this section is in here. That's got to go. So uh, right now it is, uh, it's just a, <laughs> it's a novel and it's messy, <laughs> but we'll figure it out, you know? Awesome. We will be cheering you on. I cannot wait. <laughs> when did you start writing the novel? Like, did you start this at the kind of the same time or before, or is this like a new thing that you're, you're diving into? Uh, no, I, it is, a, it is a new thing that I'm, that I'm diving into. So yes. yeah, I was lucky that, um, uh, my publishing team sort of, um, just had, and my editor had, had, uh, faith that I would be able to work through it. And so at this point, I'm just like um, powering myself through with that faith. I'm like, yeah, we'll figure it out. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we look forward to reading it when it comes out. Yeah, um, just <laughs> so you had to know we were going to go here, um, given that this is the Libro FM podcast. So we want to talk audiobooks. Good. I saw that House Gone Quiet has multiple narrators. Um, I think four is what I saw on 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 Libro. Yeah. Um, so what was that process like for you? Like, did you, like, what was your involvement? Were you talking with these folks? Did you get uh, like a say in picking? I, we've heard kind of the spectrum yeah. from different authors. So I'd love to know what it was like for you. Yeah. It would be interesting to hear what, well, I should just listen to, to more episodes, but it'd be <laughs> interesting to hear. It's good to, you uh, know, when you're taking your naps, you can like fall asleep to it, you know? Yeah. 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 Uh, but I think so. So the audiobook process typically runs behind the book publishing process. So um, an audiobook sometimes will come out just as the print book is coming out or sometimes a little bit after, which I think we know from working with them. Um, But my involvement thus far has been 
um, the Simon & Schuster audio team sent me four narrators with um, samples from books that they had read, said, here's who we're thinking for these four different stories. And I think they did a, a great job of sort of breaking down stories that had things to do with each other or maybe had narrators who were similar ages or uh, stories with a similar set. Like there's a couple of stories in the collection that sort of have like a storytelling kind of feel to them of like, sit down and I'm going to tell you like a legend of this place, right? <laughs> um, and so in some cases, the same narrators are reading those, even though they're spaced out from each other within the collection. So I'm I'm very excited and I'm hopeful that like, I think that having those varied narrators will make it feel, I mean, it's pretty common for short story collections to have uh, a couple of narrators. And I think um, that will make it feel like each story is a piece on its own as well as mm -hmm. a part of it. So I'm pretty stoked about it. Have you heard any of it yet other than the samples? I have not. I have not. I'm not sure at what point I will hear it. I, I've had some people ask if I was reading any of the stories from the collection and I'm, I'm not, and I'm very excited to hear <laughs> professional narrators read them. Instead, I had a, an opportunity with um, the Kenyan Review, who I published a story, one of the stories in this collection, Sentries with, um, a couple years ago, and they had me read uh, the story aloud for an audio version of it. And that was really wonderful, but I think also really it gave me big respect for, for <laughs> that as a, I think like that authors sort of read in a different voice than narrators do. I think there's a sort of like, if you've been to literary readings or heard people online read, there's like a sort of like cadence to especially literary fiction that authors tend to do that I think is is different from uh, like a narrated audiobook and that sort of experience. Um, and narrators are very talented. And like, I'm, I'm sure as y'all know, like a narrator can make or break uh, an audiobook, right? So yeah. I'm excited for the book to go put its best foot forward with voices that are not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a question that was going to be like, did you ever consider narrating yourself? And yeah. it seems like I've got my answer. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think like considered it, thought like, nah, because also it, <laughs> that reading that story took a ton of takes and took me like going over it again and again. And even like the version of it that exists, which is, is cool that it exists, but the version of that story that's online, there's like a train that runs. I'm like recording it in a parking lot. So there's like, and it was cicada season. So they're screaming in the <laughs> like a train that run. And I was eventually, it was just like, it was like the difference between like good and good enough. I was like, we, we got to keep <laughs> Let's wrap so it up. Go, like, <laughs> there are 10 of these. I can't do it. Like, yeah. <laughs> just like, I got to know my lane, you know? So yeah. And the narrators are going to do a way better job than I could have. So I can't wait to hear it. Um, okay. Last serious question before we have some other surprises for you. Um, what does October 17th look like? So what is launch day? Do you have like launch activities planned? Are you going on tour? Kind of like what, what is next for House Gone Quiet? I am not totally sure because it's still like sort of early in the process for that. Some of those details are still getting worked out. Um, I think that I'm going to get to go um, to Southern Festival of Books, which is exciting. That's in Nashville. Um, and I think that also I'll be doing an event at Greenlight Bookstore uh, in New York. So that's cool. Uh, and then hopefully I'll get some some DC locations in as well um, and likely be able to do a, sort of a launch event there. But, I, you know, other your guess is as good as mine. I think <laughs> we shall see, but I'm I'm really excited about it. I was going to say, Craig, Craig would like uh, to request that you come to Boston for your tour. And um, I would be very happy if you came to Detroit or Ann Arbor. So just make sure to pencil those in on the on the circuit. Tell your local bookstores to hit me up. Because I think also <laughs> the exciting thing is, uh, you know, you can have like in-person and, and now uh, in-person events are happening a little bit more. So my in-person tour might be like uh, relatively brief compared to maybe um, some other books by more established authors or um, you know, novel authors. Um, but there's like a string of virtue, you know, like hopefully this book has a long life. Um, and I feel like, um, I've already had some sort of like really wonderful support from booksellers that I know, and also booksellers that I don't like former colleagues who have helped, um, like administer events, uh, or help me, helped me put together events for this tour. Um, but hopefully I can do some virtual things too, so that even if I'm not going in person, um, to, to those places, I'll be able to still like reach audiences there and reach readers there and get to hear from people about the book. 
You mentioned um, hopefully having some DC dates. Um, is there like a dream bookstore that you're hoping for this launch event to be at? Like your favorite local bookshop? I can't pick favorite. I feel like DC has <laughs> such a wonderful book culture. And I, if I start naming them, I'm going to okay. like forget them. And then those stores are going to get mad at me. <laughs> this um, is like when you ask someone, which, which is their favorite pet? And they're like, right. I'm not answering that question. <laughs> I mean, the pets at least like don't understand human language as much <laughs> other than like, you know, their main words of like walk and whatnot. But, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's loyalty bookstores here. There's politics and prose. There's busboys and poets. There's Kramer's. Oh, I know I'm forgetting some, but there, I mean, there's a million there. Like DC has a very robust, um, book culture, really wonderful events. And I've, I've been really lucky to go to those as a reader, either virtually or in person. Um, and now, yeah, now I'm getting to attend those, those bookstores to go back to, to in-person events. So no, I'm excited. Whoever will have me. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, but not in like a desperate way, in like a cool way. You know? <laughs> Sure, I'm, I'm I'm sure that's how it will come out. Yes, yep. No, no sweat. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kelsey, our next section of the podcast we have called the lightning round, in which we are going to ask you like five or six very strange questions. Um, don't think about them too much. Okay, fast okay. questions, fast answers, and there are no wrong answers. Okay, okay. And I think, Craig, you have the first lightning round question this week. <laughs> yes. Is there a tattoo that you've always wanted but haven't gotten yet? Uh, no, I don't think so. Well, I want, I would love to get a ta- like a, a friendship tattoo with one of my best pals who's been talking about it for years. But I think I'm like too indecisive. And once I feel like a thing happens where like you then like the lead up to a tattoo, you're like, this means so much to me. Like I have like a quote from a book on my foot and then I have like an elephant you know like it they're like meaning like oh wait no this one oh it's not on <laughs> anyway I have one on my wrist like they're meaning listener is she showing us her wrist which has an <laughs> yes. elephant on it. um but then then after you get them you're sort of like all right well I got it so uh <laughs> no I feel like I'm I'm like tattooed out for a little bit mm. we'll see yeah all right um if you could eliminate one daily task from your life what would it be and why I hate washing the dishes. That's such a boring answer. I really hate washing the dishes. I really hate doing productive activities at night. I would rather just sit down. I would just rather be sitting for the last four hours of my day. I would like to just be parked, but (laughs) I don't know how houses stay clean. It's just constant effort. It is. It's just all the time. It's just all the time. I feel like the people with the cleanest houses are just like up and moving all the, I don't know how they, how they do it. So probably, probably that. Also, I really struggle with waking. I mean, I don't want to not wake up because. Then you would be dead. Then I would be dead. But waking up is a constant struggle. Every morning I'm, uh, I'm, it's a surprise to me. (laughs) So. I relate. I relate to that very much. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But we manage it. We pull it off. Here we We are. (laughs) Yeah. Morning people. I'm like, oh, can't do it. Yeah. Karen's a morning person. <laughs> that is the <laughs> worst joke you've ever told, Craig. <laughs> I'm like, here we are again. You'd think like 32 years in, I'd be better at it, but. I know, I know. <laughs> is your home a shoes off policy home or no? It is a shoe. We, we, we're going to take, we're going to take our shoes off. <laughs> Do you ever get people that come in and they're like, I don't want to take my shoes off. No, I feel like, well, recently we had some like uh, some people who were looking at our insulation, very exciting stuff. Um, <laughs> and they wore their shoes during part of it, which was cool. It was fine. And the, but I think like that's just related to my cleanliness policy because I'm mm-hmm. not I'm not consistent enough to keep a shoed floor. <laughs> a shoed floor. I just feel like if you're walking around barefoot, they're also sort of doing the work of like picking up some of the Mm-hmm. on their feet you know and then yeah. <laughs> hop right in the shower that Dude. takes care of itself oh you know? um, that is one way to clean the floor hard. yes i just um no wear shoes off wear shoes off Hello. i like it yeah <laughs> um what is your favorite thing to like show people or take them to do when they come to visit you there's a i mean i haven't taken i cannot imagine like trying to put my dad 
in a canoe. Um, but lately we have been, there's a Put him park. in. Yeah. <laughs> Picking him up. <laughs> Get in this. He'd be like, no, no. Um, <laughs> there's a, a spot near us where uh, we take our dog canoeing, where we um, like put her in the middle and she has like a, she, she's a pit. She's like a 50 pound dog. She's not tiny, but she has <laughs> a little like floaty and she sits in the middle. And then um, what always happens is that um, I'm in the front seat, which is like the seat that has less, it's a double canoe, right? So I'm in the seat that has less responsibility anyway. Um, and then actually my job becomes just keeping the dog calm for the beginning part of it. Mm. And my husband just rows us around. So it's sort of like I'm on like a gondolier kind of situation <laughs> where I'm just like chilling and petting my dog and then I'm being like taken all around the river. Um, so that's lovely. So I would, I would like to do that with a pal, but like DC has tons of, DC has so many uh, museums and like so much stuff to see, especially like down by the mall and it's free, which is just like wonderful. So, so yeah, probably a uh, museum hopping if they don't want to get in a lake. like Or, be, or being gondoliered by your husband. Yeah. yeah, Either yeah. One. If he doesn't want to put more than <laughs> just me in that boat. Then, like it's also an option to like stand up paddleboard, but it's the Potomac. So you, it's better to stay in the boat, I think. So. <laughs> What's an album you could play forever and never get sick of? Uh, I feel, okay. So like, I am always so, so, you know, there's like, okay. I, it's not that I don't like music. It's not that like, like I'm a person, I like music, but I think like, I just don't have like cool answers to music questions. So it's this sort is of judgment like, free zone, Kelsey. Like, okay. Warm up question. Like during my first, it was like, okay, my first workshop, the first day of my first workshop with Lori Moore, who's a huge deal at Vanderbilt, right? Like her, one of her like opening questions was like, if you were on a desert island, you had to listen to only one album, what would you listen to? And it's just like, I just like cannot, I don't know. I'm not (laughs) musically cool. Like I just, sometimes I just listen to what Spotify tells me to. I don't know. It's It's fair. It's fair. I cannot. I don't know what I would answer to this either. So yeah. Okay. All right. That makes me feel better. Okay. (laughs) Totally valid answer. (laughs) Um, okay, last last lightning round question. What world record do you think you have a shot at beating? I mean, I can do, um, I rarely lose an underwater like handstand competition. So like, you know how some people go to the beach and they just want to like laze in the sun and like be chill. That's not me. I want to like go in the water and then I want to like fight in the water. Like I want to go like, to the beach to win. <laughs> Yeah, I want to go like tumble around. I want like somebody to try and like throw me and me try and flip. You know, like I, I need like <laughs> I'm sort of like a child in that way where uh I just need entertainment while I'm at the beach. So I do always challenge to a handstand competition. And I I I just I rarely lose. Sometimes <laughs> it happens. The only way to get me real well, I don't know if I should say. Well, okay, the only way to get me is if you do that sort of false fall down thing you make a you make a splashing noise <laughs> and it sounds like you've succumbed to the wave yep. so then I'm gonna pop up out of there and look but I see. Mm-hmm. I see no one is allowed to use this against you in a future handstand competition because you well it's like good given the secret away for me so I just need to get like now that I've like exposed that secret now I'll just improve I'll just get better. just get better <laughs> find a new strategy <laughs> yeah it seems unlikely but I will do it so <laughs> Our last silly question to you is brought to you by a segment that we call Instagram Story Time, in which we go through your Instagram and hey, just it's like hot ones. <laughs> yes. so we're like, one. what can we, what can we learn from what you've posted recently? <laughs> um, is boring. <laughs> no, and I think Craig has has selected, or will ask the Instagram Story Time question. That seems week. like news to Craig. <laughs> it's news to me. <laughs> We discussed this yesterday. So, uh, the script, Greg. <laughs> so, Karen selected this photo. Okay, um, I, I, from, I did choose it. <laughs> yes. So this photo is of a table with a cork board on it, with orange sticky notes. With it says first big edit down," and I think it's about your editing process for your book. From for listeners, Kelsey looks like she's never seen this photo before. <laughs> this is news to her as well now. Hold on. Let's go. Let me just go home first thing. Oh, okay, so okay. Look, I'm looking at this board. I don't know why. It's, Wait, like, it's in your room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's in front of me. Uh, that was my storyboard for the collection. So it has um the it maybe this one. I wonder if this one has the it has the final title of the book. So it does, a, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, cause you know, based on the wisdom of agents and editors, we sort of like worked through some, some various titles. Um, but then it has a sticky note for each of the, each of the stories in the collection. It has the first line for the story and the last line, and then it has the word count. So that was sort of my method for, I mean, you could put 10 stories however you wanted, but I, I think what, well, um, for, for one, I think writing can feel very like nebulous. You don't get a lot of physical objects. So, so that's sort of why it's helpful to like, while you're writing, go outside and like dig a hole and put something in it for like garden purposes, not like a body, but like yeah. a plant. Um, and like a runner can, will find it after they yeah. take sporting goods. Yeah. 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 So it can be, it can be sort of nice to, <laughs> to have something physical to represent like what is very much like a, a brain thing happening. Um, so this was sort of my method for deciding either for the first time or for the final time, how things should go around. Right. Like I wanted there to be variation. I didn't want, if, if certain stories have like sort of a storytelling mode, I didn't want one to push right into the next one because that would be it will be confusing to hear the same sort of like rhythm, but in a totally different setting. So, so that's what that, that's what that is. Follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Love the final title. You mentioned that there were potentially some other titles. Are you willing to share what an a, a alternative title could have been for this? Yeah. So one was, um, I think my initial title was, well, am I going to, no, I don't think I can use it for anything. I think it's going to be fine. Uh, was this here place, which um, I sort of pulled from a Toni Morrison passage uh, that's in Beloved that I love that that passage has like the rhythm of it is so like uh, it's it's perfect. It's very like they're in a clearing and um, it's sort of like a, a revival scene that's happening in the clip. But the 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 writing is beautiful. Um, so that was one. And then we also thought about, um, the sound, the, the first story in the collection is called the sound of women waiting. Um, so we thought about that as a title. Um, but I think the collection is more than, I, I think I didn't want to misrepresent that it would only be a, a book about women and women's stories. Mm. Uh, I think it's not so tied to that particular identity though. That is like a large majority of the stories. So but House Gone Quiet, which is where we landed, um, comes from the end of one of the stories, uh, Sentries. So, and I think there's a lot of like silence and noise in the collection as well. And sort of like the house element is sort of our our community and, and whether or not we're inside or outside that community. Um, so that's where we landed. And I think that's the right place to land, so. I think so too. And we can't wait. We can't wait for October 17th. Um, <laughs> Our last thing we want to ask you um, before we let you go, what are you reading right now? Um, is there anything that you have enjoyed recently that you would recommend to us or to our listeners? Yeah, uh, I just read The Changeling by Victor Laval, um, which was great and also has a series coming out. So that was sort of my, I've been meaning to read him uh, for a while and that was sort of my my push to get into it. Um, and then... Right now I have on audio, I've got Sam Irby's new uh, essay collection. Quietly Hostile. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, love, I love Samantha Irby. Like I have all her stuff and her audiobooks are the way the way to listen to them, I think. Uh, though I think I also have that book in print. My dad just read that and was like texting me updates as he was going. He was like, this one's really funny. This one's yeah, really yeah. funny. <laughs> it's like the book where I'm in public, like going like, you know, like <laughs> yeah. laughing. It's like, it's in my, it's in my book, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, Jenna, who's on staff there at Libro, uh, had an extra early copy. I mean, not she, her early copy wasn't extra, but she had a bonus early copy of The Bastard Wilds by Lauren Groff, which I think is coming out next month. Um, so I've got that on my to read list as well as a book called women and children first, which is a debut novel by a friend of mine, uh, Alina Grabowski, that's coming out, um, from SJP lit and Zando books. Uh, and that's coming out next year in May, but I'm stoked to read those. I feel we've, I've got a little vacation coming. So I'm going to read the, I feel like I'm, I'm on vacation. Okay. I'm at the beach either to play in the water or to like basically eat a book. I'm just going to read it. And I don't want, book. I just like, don't, I think it's just like more, I feel like that's actually what I want. Like I'm reading, but don't like talk to me unless I engage <laughs> first, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm like great to go to the beach. With. <laughs> not, in, 
<laughs> nightmare. Uh, but anyway, I'm don't go talk up. to me unless I'm beating you in a yeah. competition. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I can pack light on a on a vacation besides books, and like minimum, I'm going to bring three, and I'm going to hope that yeah. they're packs because those are just like I don't. Those feel more like the beach move, like hard. Totally. They just they need more respect than I think I lend to them in a beach setting. So, I mean, paperbacks are respect to as someone who's about to <laughs> paperback. I just, they just have different feels to them, you know? I For sure. Yeah. They're easier to shake sand out of for sure. Yeah. Well, I have a, like, well, well, I'm y'all, we've talked about it before. Are y'all hardcover? I mean, no pressure based on my book. Are you lightning round questioning us right yeah, now? Yeah. <laughs> I'm turning the tables. I'm turning them. Um, are y'all bigger fans of hardcovers or paperbacks? I got to do paperback because I, I'm frequently a horizontal reader be it couch, bed, floor, other soft configuration. I like to read on my side and it is just, it's too hard to wrangle a hardcover like that. And um, I like to put it in my purse mm-hmm. when I'm likely, you know, it's just, I love a paperback. I do. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll take the other side of the coin. Uh, I'm a hardcover fan here. I just, <gasps> I just picked this one up earlier today. Uh, the new Ann Patchett book, hardcover, of course. Um, so yeah, I don't, dislike a paperback though it has a time and a place like a beach is great for it i really like old paperbacks like if you go into like a used bookstore and find some like really beat up copy of something but they for the most one. part it's so nice to yeah. have like a little community in your book yeah, yeah. Your, yeah. your shelves probably look fancier yeah yeah, yeah. i have fancy <laughs> I shelves have, like, in my room for sure paperbacks that i'm like a little bit i don't it just feels like they're more like what do you think about this i don't know <laughs> Also, I think a book. I have a hard time with like uh, book flaps and keeping because I like, do you read with your with the book jacket on it? I do. And I agree that it is a problem when it starts to slip out. Yeah. I do like that a dust jacket is a built in bookmark, which is nice, yeah, though. That is that's nice. a that's a nice feature. Yeah. A, a bonus feature of the print version of House Gone Quiet is that it will, it will, it's a paperback with flaps. Yes. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Yeah, That's yeah my, my digital copy does not have any flaps currently. So I look I look forward to picking up the, the real one. Go check out your local bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kelsey, thank you so much for spending the last hour with us. I'm sure you're super busy and have a nap to attend to or a body to dig a hole for, etc. So a beach to visit. <laughs> yes, a be- yes, somebody to beat in a handstand contest. So Ooh. Um, we look forward to your book coming out and again, congratulations and thanks for being so gracious with your time today. Yeah. I miss y'all. It's so nice talking to you. Yeah. You I too. Miss you too. Y'all have some wonderful questions about the book and I'm very excited for y'all to read it and for everybody else to read it. And just thanks for having me. All right. Have a great rest of your day. We're done. We are. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> we done it. All right, that wraps up our interview with Kelsey. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Um, we do have the audio book of House Gone Quiet available on Libro FM, and I'm sure that you can get it through your local independent bookstore as well. So we highly recommend that you check this book out. Yes, I'm super excited to read this audio book. I haven't, I haven't done that yet. I only had oh. the, I had the Net Galley version or whatever. How is the audio book? fantastic there are different narrators for different short stories so lots Mm. of different voices and performance styles i would say i loved it nice can't wait um all right karen it is my favorite time of the episode where you go (gasps) when i ask you what you're reading so what are you reading oh my gosh i thought you'd never ask thank you so (laughs) is that the response that you wanted (laughs) i am reading it the greatest audiobook ever. Um, I was recently at Heartland Fall Forum in Detroit and a bookseller recommended this audiobook to me. It is called Sisters of the Lost Marsh. It is by Lucy Strange, who has written many, many other books that are beloved. And this book is unput downable for me. Um, are you, I see you typing right now. Are you looking it up? <laughs> no, I, I'm like, I know Lucy Strange. So I was like Googling like, what other books would I know? Um, and then I giggled because you said unput downable, which is a very Karen <laughs> thing to say, and I like it. Um, so this book is it's very fairy tale esque, I would say. It's about six sisters who live in this kind of marshland 
village. Um, they live with a really terrible father, but a really wonderful grandmother. And there's kind of this lore around the existence of six sisters living in a family. Um, so they have learned about this lore. They feel that they are cursed because there are six of them. A bunch of things, a bunch of things start happening. Um, the crux of which is that the full moon fair comes to their small village. And on the last night of the full moon fair, they are allowed to attend. Um, all kinds of shenanigans start. None of this is spoilery, I promise. This is all in the description. But the older sister vanishes after uh, the full moon fair has been there. Our main character, her name is Willa. Um, kind of where I'm at right now in this telling is that she's on a quest to get her sister back, her older sister, Grace, and kind of uncover if this curse is real and if it is real, what she needs to do to protect and save her other sisters. Cannot get enough. Highly recommend. I love it. It sounds great. It's wonderful. You had me at Moon Fair or whatever. <laughs> full Moon Fair, yes. Yeah, full. Yep. <laughs> it reminds me of like the the night market and all of that. So Yeah, I'm... and what's the Aaron Morgenstern book, uh, The Night Circus? Mm -hmm. That beautiful, beautiful book. I That cover is one of my favorite book covers. I think Which I've cover? I have like three copies of that book. Uh, that makes sense. It's a problem. <laughs> 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 and if a new edition comes out, I will buy it. You'll get that too. Yes. Um, well, there's also one other thing I'm reading, but I suspect that you might be reading it or have just finished it. Yeah, don't well. don't steal my thunder here. I, I shan't. Uh, <laughs> Craig, what are you reading right now? <laughs> oh my God, I thought you'd never ask. Um, I just finished Stars in Your Eyes by Case and Calendar. Yay. Um, I loved this book so much. It is very. Um, difficult at points it's very um you know there's a lot of like trauma and heartbreak it's very difficult but it's also extremely funny it's like it's got it all i loved this book for listeners it is i'm gonna sum this up as shortly as i can um for an obvious reason that i'll get to in a second basically there's this happy-go-lucky actor who everyone loves and like never i bet he's never jaywalked he's like the golden boy, I think is what they keep calling him in the book. And um, he's co-starring in a film with the complete opposite. The grumpy, crotchety, angry, foul-mouthed bad boy of Hollywood who's gotten into tons of, um, you know, tabloidy type issues. Duffles. <laughs> yes. Um, and the film is tanking, basically, because um, of drama. So they pretend to be fake boyfriends for the sake of the film um and that is not a spoiler that's like on the jacket so i won't go any further um but it is lovely and the reason i won't go any further is because we're going to be talking about this book a whole lot um because case and calendar is our next guest for the podcast I'm at the so time excited. of excited i know <laughs> this is this is your v schwab moment as you put it, it. is i <laughs> yeah. i have been hoping for so long that we could talk to Case and, and yes, this is the equivalent of when you got to talk to V.E. Schwab. Felix Ever After by Case and Calendar is one of my favorite books of all time. I cannot recommend it enough. I'm smiling so big. <laughs> I know. I'm really excited too. Funny enough, this is actually my first Case and Calendar book. Well, are you going to read the other ones now? Yeah, of course. I love <laughs> this book. Yes. Um, no, I'm so, so excited. Um, and at the time of recording, we are interviewing Kazen tomorrow so i'm so nervous i'm nervous for you <laughs> <laughs> is that helpful <laughs> gee thanks <laughs> <laughs> so yes super exciting go buy this book it is so good so that is the book that i finished and um not to belabor this podcast and just add the minutes but i do i'm obsessed with the book that i'm reading right now so i want to belabor talk about it a second. belabor it yeah belabor <laughs> it tell me everything i am midway through maybe about 40 to 50 percent ish of a book that i am falling in love with um it's not like a haunted house book in the sense of what you would think but it totally is a haunted house book it's very unique um it's told from multiple perspectives which i love and the house is one of the perspectives which i think is very fun when i say this book has trigger warnings there's an entire part before the audiobook starts um and there's an entire page about it in the paper book this book has all of the trigger warnings Okay. Whatever ones exist, they're in this book. So this book is very, it's a, it's a difficult read. It's got transphobia. It's got 
self-harm assault it's very hard but totally worth it um if that is something that's not going to bother you obsessed with this book did you say the name and the ti- and the, the title and the author oh yet? no uh <laughs> really burying the lead here so thanks <laughs> this is why you're thank thanks for keeping the podcast on track karen uh the name of the book is tell me i'm worthless by allison rumfit i can't wait to pick this up that's it that's all i'm reading well, thank you for the recommendations. <laughs> One of them I am also currently reading, and I'm glad that you didn't say more about stars in your eyes because I have just a smidgen left to finish tonight. So I appreciate. I I was bordering spoilers. on spoilers too. So yeah. Oh, that would have been cruel and unusual. <laughs> um, well, are we allowed to kind of talk about the next episodes we have coming up? Because I'm very well, excited what we just about did. Them. So yeah, I know, but okay, <laughs> so. As of right now, the the day we are recording this, um, the Libro FM team, many of us are going to go to Austin, Texas for the Texas Book Festival. And Craig and I have this really cool opportunity to interview a bunch of the authors that are going to be there. We've been doing all kinds of emailing, all kinds of scheduling. Thank you, Craig, for like There's wrangling. There's a lot of spreadsheets involved. Yes, I was going to yes. say thank you for wrangling this like epic spreadsheet that you've created. Um, we are creating this lineup that I just cannot believe in terms of the authors that are going to be talking to us. So get ready. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty crazy, actually. Um, I feel like I won't say who the authors are because a million things could happen. Um, so I don't want to say that we're going to have X author and then that person is like, sorry, I have to go to a lunch or something. But I am so excited for this list. One of the authors in particular has written a book that I am, you know, I am obsessed with. Um, do. It's not V.E. Schwab. Um, <laughs> but no, I'm super excited and nervous. It's going to be like a rapid fire of talking to like six or seven, like pretty amazing authors all back to back to back. Yeah. And in the same room with them, like when the only other time we've done this was when we interviewed Ann Patchett in Nashville. So here we go. Come on the journey with us. I, um, I, I will say that when we did that, I was insanely nervous, not only because it was Ann Patchett, but I've never done the like in-person recording thing before. Yeah. And it was same. also episode like five. I barely, I was a little podcast baby. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we both were. We both were. But we learned a lot. And we're gonna... Yes, it's now been a year. So <laughs> hopefully we can do this slightly better now, you know, so. Basically so. experts. Yes. Um, and you mentioned this tomorrow at the time of recording. We're talking to Case and Calendar, which is going to be wonderful if i can keep my acts together and not just completely from your face right now i'm not (laughs) concerned you're concerned (laughs) (laughs) um and then you know we're talking about a few other things but the one thing i wanted to mention is that i am i have my my heart set on a romance bookstore episode for february (laughs) there are so many amazing bookstores that are dedicated to romance and have just been so beautifully created and curated. Like I'm thinking about me, cute. I'm thinking about the ripped bodice. I could just talk about this all day long. So we're hoping to get some of the store owners and booksellers from those shops together on the podcast and talk to them a little bit more about um, how they've built these beautiful spaces and how they curate their titles. And to be very on the nose, this episode should air in February for Valentine's Day. Hooray! How, how adorable. So if you work at Meet Cute or Ripped Bodice and you're hearing this, <laughs> please Shoot expect an email. A, expect an email shortly. <laughs> yes. All right, Karen, we have teased enough episodes. We have, we're we're all the way into February. I think it's time to wrap yeah. this podcast up. Do you want to do you want to hit us with the tagline? I would love to. As always, thank you for listening. <laughs>